Welcome to the Pure Parenthood podcast, brought to you by Pure Baby. I'm your host, Tiffany Wells, and I'm the head educator here at Pure Baby. Hi, everyone. Well, today we're lucky enough to be joined by Kara Tane Kaz, aka Karen Wilcox. Karen is a clinical nurse educator at Karatane and features on their social media lives regularly. So you may recognize her reassuring and calming voice. This week's episode is all about introducing a new sibling into the family. We'll discuss some helpful advice on how to prepare your little one for a new arrival, which can be a big change for the whole family. Welcome to our podcast, Karen. So lovely to have you on today. Thank you, Tiffany. It's a pleasure to be here and it's nice to see you again. Lovely to see you too. So Karen, to start off our discussion today, how can we best prepare children for the arrival of new siblings? I think that can be a really challenging time, as we said, for everyone. So if you could just take us through some some preparation for families there. One of the important things is, is to make sure we include children in a conversation about when you're having a child, I guess generally after the pregnancy is well established, not too early in the pregnancy, but say maybe even midway when you're starting to show and thinking about some of the changes that might be happening in your family, like moving house perhaps, or you might be even thinking about changing them to a toddler bed and moving them into a different room. Mm. All of those things, is, it's good to put some context to for the little toddler around why that might be happening. The conversation that you might have with a toddler would it be kind of in this overexcited kind of way or even in an underwhelming and not even talking about kind of way, but it's more like, oh, hey, buddy, or, you know, Tom or, you know, Susie or whatever. You know what's going to be happening? We're having a, a new family member join our family mm. um, as an example. Mm. And part of that is you're, you're going to get to enjoy having a brother or sister. You might even use picture books. You might have other family members that have had a, a new birth of a baby and you could refer to that to give some context about all of this. Mm. But the actual moving of rooms or moving house, not necessarily to attribute that to the baby. Mm. Uh, because sometimes then if it was a difficult experience for the toddler, it's kind of like the baby's fault. Yes. Um, so it's good. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, it's time to move to a big bed, you know. Um, that's what happens. It's just like mommy and daddy have got a big bed. You're moving into a big bed now, but it's not because of the baby. Mm. We're going to move house so we've all got more space and, we, you know, our family's growing but it's not because of the baby as such. Mm. Think about some of the resources you might have available for the toddler, and that might be picture books, that might be even having a getting a little dolly and letting them kind of saying, oh, you've got your little baby and those sorts of things. Those things are available so that they can kind of understand it and do some of their own role play and kind of feel like they are connecting to the baby because often when um, babies arrive, we talk, sometimes it's easy to talk like as if they're gonna have a new playmate, but really when a newborn comes, we don't want them picking them up and playing with them. Mm. You know, you want them, you want to start a relationship, but they're not a new play toy, but their dolly could be their new play toy. Yeah. So it's kind of like parallel play, that mm. sort of thing, rather than thinking this baby is going to be this just awesome friend that can do all these things with a toddler. Mm. And then they get into trouble then because they're touching them and wanting to hold them. And there's been an expectation that really in real life we often are quite cautious about supervising them and making sure they're not just automatically picking up and using them as a toy. Mm. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I think when you're saying to prepare them with you know, the toys, like a doll, and introducing that idea of a new family member coming into the home and how that might be for them. I think, like you said, yeah. great advice around having some tools in place and talking about it leading up to it. It'd probably be similar if you had an app like a dog, for example, doing some training with them around a bit of separation or a bit of, you know, seeing those boundaries in place and things like that, I'm sure would be some of those things you need to think about. Yeah, yeah. And I guess knowing too that trying to put ourselves in our children's shoes, um, there was an awesome book written a few years ago now by Lady Gowry Child Care Services and it was called In Their Shoes. Okay. And it talks a lot about what is it like to be a young, like a two-year-old or a three-year-old and suddenly have to come to terms with a new person entering the family. Mm. And they liken some of the examples to what, how would you feel if your partner brought home another woman and said, I love them just as much as you. 
<laughs> or do you know what I mean? Like those kind of things and you think, well, that's, I don't think that's great. Yeah. So sometimes we, we kind of use ways of explaining the introduction of a new family member, but there is some level of uncertainty, isn't there, about what does this mean for me mm. and my relationship with my mum or dad? Of course they're not thinking in that adult way, mm. but there's often we all have that sense of needing to still feel the same level of acceptance and connection and mm. spending quality time with mum or dad because mm. that's obviously going to be taken up caring for the baby, a lot of that. Mm. So there's something also so about realizing well when the baby comes I'm still going to have to kind of quarantine some quality time with my toddler mm. so that there's this real one-on-one -on -one and it's not just you know almost just on the fly yes that it's really yes. purposeful that we're going to spend really nice time together and it's focused on them and mm. not even about trying to squeeze them in between feeds or anything like that mm. and taking turns with that with both relationships so they still feel really connected. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. And I think, like you said, with I remember with my kids, it was it was challenging, particularly when I had the third um, come along because you feel like you're stretched in many, many ways. But I guess, like mm. you said, having that purposeful time and just really making sure that... Um, if you're lucky enough to have two parents, making sure that one of them is kind of yes. spending that quality time with the other children where possible and that you really just making that special time and having that special connection at, at certain times throughout the day um, and making yeah, that specific purposeful time for them, I think is great advice, absolutely. So I think everyone's heard of sibling rivalry there, Karen, but can you tell everyone yeah. or, or clarify with everyone a little bit more about what it is and how, what actually causes it in little one's minds? Yeah, and I guess I started to think about that when I introduced this idea of, you know, what would we feel like if we had to share a partner mm. with somebody that <laughs> came home and said, you know, hey, don't worry, I still love you, but I've got this other person now as well. You know, some of us might be really threatened by that. Yes. You know, um, and so for little people, I guess, there's a couple of things that happen. Their, their world has been that they're the centre of their parents' world often. Mm. Um, and they have this undivided attention. You have more time, you have more energy. Mm. And suddenly now, even throughout the pregnancy, if you've had a difficult pregnancy, that's separating in terms of the relationship changes because if mum has been unwell physically or maybe even been in hospital, mm. there's been some separations from that, then that's quite difficult for a toddler whose emotional regulation is still developing. Mm. They can't use reason. Um, not until you're around three or um, to six years of age do they learn emotional regulation and reasoning. Mm. And so, you know, there's a sense of they, their brain actually can't comprehend things the same as an adult brain can. Mm. Um, so we have to kind of just understand they might have reactions and we're questioning, well, I wonder what this is about. And they might like, don't go, mommy, or I still love you, or they might push the baby away once they've arrived. This is about feeling where do I fit in to my mum and dad or mum or dad's um, world mm. like am I now displaced yes am I still important am I still the apple of their eye mm. like and I'm not coping and so the obvious equation is this person has come and suddenly my my whole world has changed and I'm not happy about it mm. and sometimes they do really act out so children who really struggle with if their language is not fully developed they haven't got the words um, they might have a very physical response to distress, so they might, you know, I have seen little ones pick up a shoe and throw it at the person holding the baby. Mm. Um, they might do this, but this is them expressing, I, I don't know where I stand. I'm not coping with this adjustment. I don't know how to manage. Mm. And really under, underlying all of that is this sense of, do I still have a place? Do Am I still got a sense of belonging? Am I still connected in the same way? And so it's trying to work out, well, how can I give them that? Yeah, you have to meet your baby's needs, don't you? Yeah, Karen, I look, I totally agree with all that. And I think when, in my personal situation, I actually had my son who was a bit delayed with his speech. Um, he had a few issues with being able to express himself, so he didn't talk until quite late. So it was really challenging because my older daughter, she did speak a lot, very much a little chatterbox, and she was able to express herself. She'd often even speak for him or say, he's trying to say this or he's trying to say that. 
And so when we had the third one come along, he really struggled with being able to communicate how he was feeling and often would act yeah. out with, um, yeah, in his actions and, and other ways because he couldn't communicate the, what he wanted to say, yeah. I guess. So, and he was only quite young. So it was 21 months between my third and my second. So it, it was really challenging for a while because he wasn't able to, you know, connect in any way or communicate, I guess, in any, in any way that way. So it was about finding other ways to communicate with him. And it was a really challenging time. But, you know, we got through it. And as you do, as parents, yes. you find ways. And, like, books are really great with that, spending time sitting down looking at books and talking about feelings and things like that. So it can be a challenging time, I, you know, and it's great that you've, I guess, highlighted some of those feelings that might be real for those toddlers at that time. Yes. It can also bring up really strong feelings for families too, like for parents, Mm. because sometimes we've all got our own lived experience of our own sibling relationships. If we're, you know, we've got siblings ourselves and we might even still be holding some of those memories, you know, where it didn't work out or maybe we felt like we were, you know, people make jokes or reference to, I guess, things like, oh, they're the middle child or, you know, because there's that real sense of we're all trying to get a sense of identity mm. and belonging and we're trying to work out, well, what does it all mean when this happens? And I guess the capacity of parents to manage their own feelings as well or feel like, oh, why why isn't my child acting like this? I, I was trying to raise happy, loving children and suddenly they've turned this acting out physically, you know, hurting or, uh, you know, chasing down their siblings and you're thinking, what is going on? Where, is, where did this come from? Yeah, um, but yeah. I think don't lose hope. I think that happens and it it can seem surprising when you are creating a really, you're doing your best to be a good enough parent, but these things happen is more about, well, how do we respond to that? Mm. And so some of the things that we could do is kind of, is acknowledge, as you said, those emotions that you might say, hey, buddy, you know, we've got to be careful with baby, he's still little, he's got to learn to manage, you know, he's going to, he's going to take a little while to be able to talk or You can hold him, but I'm going to have to help you hold him so he stays safe. Mm. So focus on the important things like baby's still learning how to be, to communicate or Mm. things like, I can see you're really upset and you wanted to hold him or carry him because they often try and drag the baby off your lap or they want to pick them up off the floor. And, you know, and you might be thinking, what are you doing? No, put him down. And so they they think, I've got this new sibling. I thought we were going to be friends. And now if I go near him, I'm in trouble. Mm. So I guess it's trying to explain what they can do. And that's when you would be introducing other things. How about you show, you know, say baby Tom, how you build blocks. Mm. How about you show baby, you're such a good big brother. He's going to learn so much from you. And you're almost giving them a role in the family Mm. and a way of relating that's useful and meaningful. And it's often very valued by mums. And remember, children just want to have a sense of belonging, Mm. acceptance, Mm. and feel valued in their family. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So if we find ways to create that, then they're going to feel more like, oh, this is okay, I can do this. My parents still think I'm awesome. This is great. (laughs) And that's that's what we all want for them. And we want to feel that connectedness. We want to feel, you know, the harmonious feeling. We don't want to have these, you know, issues where one of them's feeling really left out or what have you. So I think it's great. Yeah. And it's good that you've highlighted some ideas around how parents can sort of help avoid these situations and clarify that and how it can clearly affect, you know, both children, I think, coming into it. Is there anything else that you could give tips on how to avoid this sibling rivalry? Because I think any tips are going to be useful here, Karen? Some of the things that we would say for mums or dads is to think about making a mental list of when a, especially a young child under three, for instance, gets fixated on something and you say you're breastfeeding or bottle feeding or whatever you're doing and you're preoccupied with the baby and the toddler comes in and wants your attention. Mm. Rather than saying, not now I'm doing this with the baby, think of ways that you can actually notice them still. To, even if you're settling, sometimes we worry that talking and trying to settle a baby, for instance, means a baby will never learn to sleep. But that's actually not true. Babies are reassured by a calm parent voice and will sleep even with toddlers in the room and other people in the room. Mm. As long as they feel like the room is 
we're all under control, we're all mm. okay. Mm. And so sometimes I guess what we have to do is saying, oh, we're using our quiet voice. I often will tell parents to bend down beside the cot but still make eye contact with their toddler because the baby just needs your hand and your quiet voice. It doesn't matter about the words really. Mm. And you're talking to your toddler and say, oh, do you know where your red truck is? Or, hey, I haven't seen Dolly for a while. So you're going to send them on missions mm. that they can go and find a toy and it's not about the baby because you haven't even mentioned the baby. Mm. You're just distracting them with an activity and you're not kind of rejecting them or pushing them away because mm. you're preoccupied with needing to get the baby to sleep or I've got to feed. So you have a mental list of what are the things I can kind of give some attention that I don't have to leave what I'm doing, but he still or she still feels like mum's engaging and I can do these little activities. Mm. And I can go, oh, good on you, you found that. Now, you mm. might get a collection of things you absolutely don't want, mm. but if you just <laughs> keep it in a little basket... <laughs> And you can pack those up at the end of the day. It doesn't matter. But it means then the child's got something to do, something to distract themselves and feel like, oh, your mum still sees me. Mum still knows or dad still knows. And I've done something that I can praise them for. Yeah. They are good on you, aren't you? Clever. You found that toy. wonder how it works. And you can kind of coach them to do activities and you're not making it about the baby so much yeah that's great so are there some things typically that do affect that firstborn like you've mentioned a few things there but would you say there's like a you know top five things that do tend to I guess affect that firstborn when the new baby comes the risk is that if we protect the baby so much from the toddler that they don't get a chance to play on the floor safely and do their physical development Mm. if they feel actually if we're not protecting them enough so sometimes you know setting up furniture and creating a safe place and maintain that could be in a, a you know a play area that's set up for the baby so they can roll around and without fear of being jumped on or trod on or something mm. like that mm. being with them so they do get to kind of know each other and they're building their own relationship because they do need help to develop that together because I guess stress for anybody is not good for our well-being. And little babies can feel stress. Mm. Protecting the, their sleep time so that they're getting their more easy going, I guess. Sleep really affects all of us. Mm. Um, and so for little babies, then they need to have their sleep protected. And so sometimes even putting a, a bell on the infant's bedroom door it hears when you're getting break-ins from the toddler <laughs> who goes to wake the baby or jump in with them yeah, yeah, um, yeah things like that and I guess the other thing that can happen for the toddler as well or different age children throughout so as they grow they usually have different developmental milestone stages so for instance a three-year-old play is all about building up so creating a little you know, say Duplo Village or a Barbie doll collection or creating things and building things up. Mm. But for children that are, say, 18 months or 12 months, they're into knocking it down and pulling it down. Mm. So creating times in the day where the baby does his baby play and talking about, oh, no, babies need to play this and Mm. these are his toys and he's going to have his special play time. Mm. But actually then you're going to protect it for the older child that they're going to have their special play time and that might mean they sit up at a table so the baby can't come and knock down their creations Mm. Mm. because they've got different developmental needs and they get really frustrated if they're not allowed to be themselves either, the Mm. toddler, and we're always protecting the baby but we don't think about protecting the needs of the toddler or preschooler. Yeah, yeah. I remember with my first, she sort of, when we had the second, was very much like wanting to come into our bed and not wanting to sleep in her bed as much. So there was a bit of regression there. There was a few toilet training issues and things when the, you know, when the the third baby came. And so those sort of things quite typical that they sort of find that those things happen. Yeah, that's right. That they will, they will regress. And I guess it's, again, it's funny when you said that about your little one coming into your bed and that can happen. And when you're tired, with a baby you might think oh gosh all right and you might let that happen a couple of nights and then think what have I done yeah I guess this when we know why they might be doing this why they might be regressing in one area because when they've got to actually develop in say emotional development to cope with the adjustment of a new baby Mm. then they'll often regress in another area yes 
So as you're surging in one area of development, then something else will kind of drop off a bit. And that's kind of normal until it bounces out and everything progresses again. Mm. And I guess with, especially with sleep and settling, um, then it might be say, all right, you're going to have one night cuddles. And I know you had a hard time, but it's time to come back to bed. Mm. And you might have to, you, you might be better off just spending more time settling them back in their bed Mm. Uh, rather than letting them start their habit because it's hard to get them out once they've got there because in a way we're reinforcing we're saying you've got every reason to be distressed and upset Mm. but really it's just a it's a normal process of getting used to another person in your home Mm. it doesn't really warrant saying you have to now sleep with mum and dad because that's the only way I'm going to get my needs met. Mm. That can kind of send mixed messages, can't it? So mm. Mm. I guess if you're meeting the needs in another way during the day, understanding it might affect their sleep, but you want to, if you want good sleep, then you're going to have to help them accept there's still time to go to bed in their bed. It just might take a bit more work to do that. Yes, yeah. Well, I remember with my son too, second time around. So when I had the third, I was really trying to prepare him for self-settling before the the, the last, the third baby, the last baby came along. So yeah, no more right. babies for me. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to, you know, really spend a lot of time getting him to self-settle because he went through a period where he needed me to kind of be in the room when he was going to sleep, either patting him to bed or rocking him to sleep and that sort of thing. So it took quite a while to to get him out of that and I was quite heavily pregnant until it came to the time finally when he was able to to self-soothe and get himself off to sleep. Um, So I remember that was a bit of a challenge, but it definitely paid off. And I'm so glad I did spend that time getting that sorted before the new baby came because I wouldn't have been able to do both at at that point in time because he he wanted to be with mum, you know. That was that thing before bed was needing mum a lot. So it took quite a while of sort of laying beside the bed on a mattress with my hand on his, you know, on his chest was and then slowly progressing sort of out of the room night by night, getting further and further away and just using my voice. And so I remember that was really challenging for a couple of weeks, but I'm so glad I, w- I was persistent and stuck with it. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. That's a great, I mean, that is the best time to do it before the second one or third one arrives. Mm. The other really nice thing is, and children are going through like moving house and adjustment or starting preschool, which can happen when you just had a baby, their development is ready to start to move out. They've got two things. They're learning to socialize more external to the home environment, but mm. they've also got this, what does this mean? <laughs> Am I being replaced at home? And they can get that, like, well, what's happening there? Am I missing out? Almost like a FOMO. Mm. Um, so they, they've got a big adjustment. Um, but I guess to what happens before bed, is thinking about, especially with toddlers and preschoolers, is having that time factored in to go rather than rushing that process and using it, let's review, like almost like how do we reconnect mm. before bedtime at night and kind of make sure we're okay, like I'm okay and you're okay before you go to sleep. And that mm. would be not just a bath story in bed and the task of getting them ready, but it's kind of like a little cuddle and conversation around you know, like you might tell them, oh, we've had a tough day today. We had a few tough times, didn't we? Or, you know, well, you had a busy day and you had a lot of upsets today. Um, you know, mummy or, or daddy, whoever it is, you know, we love you. And you kind of want to reconnect and build that relationship again mm. because it's easy to have kind of conflict or tensions or breakdowns in communication. Mm. But if every day you're kind of reconnecting and helping them kind of feel like, you know what, no matter what happens, we're okay, mm. it's much easier to sleep well as because these things are playing in the back of their mind, even if they course wouldn't have the words they wouldn't have the cognitive understanding but they have the feelings Mm. and so we can reassure them with that you know nice cuddles gentle words we don't pretend it's not happening Mm. but just in simple language talk about oh we've had a tough day today you know mummy or daddy still loves you Mm. even there's books about siblings getting along with their baby brother or sister Mm. and that could be good ways to have conversations to help them adjust emotionally to that change Mm. no that's great so lastly i guess what i want to just cover off for everyone listening today is just some general tips and tricks to use when introducing a sibling or baby to the family karen because i think we've covered lots today but i guess just to finish off so people have these at the top of their mind so part of your pregnancy time is letting them know that there's a new family member coming Mm. 
and, and in an enthusiastic but not an over-the-top way. Mm. The other one is make sure you're planning for some one-on-one time with your toddler and other children. And that doesn't have to be a long time. We're talking five minutes a day of focused attention with anyone usually fills their cup. Mm. Um, as long, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't have to be really extensive time. Mm. Having a list of activities that you can do while you're distracted with caring for your baby so that you're still engaging with the toddler that they could do. And that might be a felt board in the nursery while you're settling, mm. wired toys, mm. you know, like little soft books, um, dollies, and not being afraid to still talk just because you're settling or feeding your baby. You're just using your voice in a calm way will calm your baby, but it'll also keep your toddler calmer. Mm. So we're not losing that sense of, you know, feeling like, oh, my, I can't manage all this. Yeah. <laughs> Our voice usually escalates. So thinking about your voice and those sorts of things and also realising that it's okay to protect your baby to have space for their development. and But equally, your older child needs space and appropriate activities and engagement um, for their development. Mm. They're not going to be the same. They actually can't be interacting in the same way as when they're like two and three. So how you do that conversation about we're going to be keeping babies safe. We can gently, using the word gently a lot is helpful. Mm. We gently hold the baby. Mummy's going to sit with you or daddy. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thanks again for your wonderful support for all the parents listening today, Karen. It's been so helpful. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tiffany. It's been a pleasure been so great so if you're looking for more support with regards to bringing a new member of the family home and introducing them to their siblings or any other pressing parenting questions you can head over to www.caratane.com.au follow them on those socials or you can call the Caratane care line on 1300 227 464 thank you so much for taking the time to tune in today i hope you found this helpful Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends about this podcast. And if you like listening, please leave us a review. See you next time.